Good afternoon. This is wonderful symposium organized by Care Group for the innovative solution for presbyopia and refractive ears. So nowadays, these days, lots of changes occurring in all kind of pachycoyal and trifocal lenses. So new, new research are going on. Every company is claiming my research it's lens is superior. But uh, I am reading the trifocal about oh, yeah. the trifocal yesterday. It is wonderful lens. Well, yeah. well, and I will invite the first speaker for one step refractive solution, Dr. Kamal Kapoor. So there will be 10 minutes for the talk and 5 minutes for a discussion. So you can calm yourself. One HDMI to VGA cut and take it from there. I think they have uh, some incompatibility issue with the cable. Uh, HDMI to VGA cut. Ke do. Okay. Uh, I don't see many audience, but I guess whoever's here is the interested one. And that's what eventually matters. Uh, I think got it. Yeah. So see, I was right. There was a problem in the cable. OK, so. Duplicate or OK, got it. OK, so I'll be talking about uh, one-step refractive solution. Mostly my stock will be centered around the fakic lens, but I'll be touching on some other things which I feel actually are one-step refractive solution for the patients. We've done nearly 2,000 uh, uh, IPCLs uh, to name some. And I guess uh, I've been doing this uh, particular lens for last over six years and I have the longest follow-up probably uh, of last six years. Uh, there's no financial disclosure. I'm just a friend and a KOL uh, for K Group. There's no financial relationship. Now let us start by talking. When we talk about refractive solution, what is the first thing which comes to our head? LASIK. But is LASIK as good as a fakey lens is a question. And especially when you move from moderate to higher powers, I feel the plus point of a fakey lens far is far better than your LASIK. Because you're not altering the corneal biomechanics, you're not touching the tear film. As it is, we all know, dry eye is on the crease. You are not pupillary size dependent, especially in higher powers, where if you have a large pupil, you're restricted. Vision recovery is far more stable and unpredictable. Higher powers, there are no regressions. There are no issues with IL calculation post cataract surgery because you don't, all you need to do is explant the lens and take the cataract away. You can put these patients for multifocal and EDOF even after explantation. Whereas in LASIK, there are a lot of plus and minus points because LASIK by itself may induce some aberrations, change the prolation or the Q value of the cornea where you might have restriction for using lenses. Retinal size image is definitely better. You can work on a larger optical zone, predictability is yes, and it's a reversible procedure. Unlike LASIK, which is not a reversible procedure, this is a reversible procedure. Once you do a LASIK, fire laser on the cornea, you're done with. You can't do anything. Any trauma to the eye, mild trauma will not do any problems, whereas in LASIK you may have flap issues, folds, evulsions, tears, dislodging, and of course, no alteration of contrast sensitivity, which again you may see in the LASIK. So what is an IPCL? IPCL is a single hydrophilic lens. It is available in different powers. And unlike all other uh, lenses, it comes with a special design, which actually is very compensatory for a very high vault. And it does not cause more increase in trochlear pressure. I have patients where they are maintaining a vault of 1180 microns for the last two years, and they are doing absolutely fine. I have patients maintaining a vault of 280 microns, 290 microns, and they are doing fantastic. Let's see our numbers. Approximately 1,452 of V1 model, 464 of V2 model, six years follow-up, 
17 cases of piggyback, which I especially use this lens for piggyback procedure for patients who've been operated and have had other surgeries done, other cataract surgeries done, and they have residual refractive errors, they have astigmatism. I love to use this lens because of the predictability and the smart toric nature, which we will discuss. Also done presbyopic, they have corrected powers starting from plus six to minus 34. Refractive errors like astigmatism, keratoconus, corneal scars, secondary piggyback, name a thing, I've done all of them. So what are the situations you can actually use this? How does it become a one-step procedure? Till minus 34, moderate to refractive powers. I've done this procedure in patients with corneal scars, induced astigmatism, and they've improved fantastic vision. Exceptionally large corneas, where the other company or competition may not be able to give you the product, I've done till 14.25 millimeter size. Large pupil size of 8.5 millimeter, I've done the procedure. So hugely large pupils, large corneas, large astigmatism, large refractive errors. This is where this particular thing comes to your help, where the competition can't even touch it. Secondary piggyback procedures, we'll go and see the, I'll just touch very briefly. Basic objective is to do a good subjective refraction. I would recommend everybody to do a cycloplegic refraction because some of these myopic patients may be still accommodating to your surprise. Pupil size measurement is very important, both undilated and dilated. Why you need an undilated pupil in a scotopic situation? Because you don't want the pupil to be bigger than the optic size. And if the pupil does not dilate well, and in case you're going in for a larger size for a beginner, it may be an issue. So uh, one advice, because I keep getting phone calls from all my friends, is when you dilate the pupil, the vault will increase. So don't be surprised. Most of the time when the surgeon sees the patient next day and he dilates, and suddenly his heart is in his mouth because the vault has gone to 900 microns from 700. It is explainable. Don't worry. And when you put a pupil constricting drop, the vault will go down. So don't be surprised in case you've used pilocarpine a day before and second day postoperatively your pupil is small, you will have a lesser vault. So over 2,000 cases done, I know all these facts, I have these figures which I've written, your vault can increase by 125 to 180 microns on dilatation. In case you see an opacity behind the lens, this opacity could be just a retained viscoelastic, so initially within first few days if you see an opacity, don't be afraid. This is just a subset of some, some uh, uh, sizes, overall sizes. Majority of the sizes we used are more than 12.5 millimeter, which is around 97%. This is just a subset of the last uh, 300 patients we have. 7% patients were just on a little shallower side, but again, due to the central hole, a beautifully architectured tapering central hole, you do not get glare, and yet you do not get cataract even on a lower wall. And don't be surprised actually to see this 78% more than six by nine, because most of these patients are high myop, minus 30, minus 28, minus 29. They never had a vision better than six by 24, and now they're touching 618, six by 12, which is far better than even their best corrected vision. So even at a 78% score of six by nine and above is a huge, huge score. This is how the lens looks like. Few points for beginners. These two holes are supposed to be on the top, and this is the, 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 the leading or the trailing loop has to be on the right, and the leading loop has to be on the left. All you need to do is you do this, and you're ready to go. This is, and I'll just now show you a video. Now, the rest of the presentation is just videos. We'll just see basic loading and tell you how this lens is different than other lenses. You pick up the lens. This is how the lens looks like. This is the knuckle which should be coming on the left side and the other knuckle should be coming on the right. So I've inverted the lens, loaded it, and now we're ready to go. The best part about this lens is it's a smart lens, meaning you do not need to dial this lens. You just push it in, only two marks are required, zero and 180, no secondary marking. And I am sure we all agree, you cannot go wrong with a zero 180 degree. It's the simplest way to mark the cornea. Once you mark the cornea, all you need to do is put the lens at 0, 180 because the company manufactures the lens with inherent toricity according to your requirement. So no dialing, no gymnastics. The way you load the lens is a simple wing cartilage, butterfly cartilage. So no gymnastics of going in with a sponge, holding a forceps, twisting your wrist, bending your shoulder. Just load it like a normal IOL and push it in. So this is, I'll just now zoom in fast. You make two side ports, viscoelastic, 
And now, this is how the lens actually beautifully opens. And the best part is, in case you feel it has opened the wrong side or upside down, you can simply go with the forceps and pull it out from the same incision. It's such, such a soft, soft lens that you don't need to enlarge the incision. Just go in, hold it, and pull it out. It'll come out. Then you can, and it doesn't break. It's a very stretchable lens. You can reposition it to the position you want, put it back in, and the same lens can be used. So you enclavate the, uh, the pads. Once the pads are there, and now you will notice, all you need to do is match this with these lines. This with these lines, and you're ready to go. No need to dial. Because the lens has got an inherent cylinder. This is, I'm just trying to show the audience that, and now it's in. You do an irrigation aspiration. The central hole, I use the Bernoulli's principle of physics. I do not have inverted irrigation aspiration on the hole. I place it vertically. It creates a lot of turbulence in that area, and it just sucks the viscoelastic. So you'll notice all the viscoelastic from behind is, this is the viscoelastic strands which are still coming. I, at times, I use these extra holes. I just can do a little bit of irrigation aspiration on top of the hole, and all viscoelastic comes out. So once this is through, let's see the salient points. You need to place the lens at 0, 0,180. Four years after follow-up, still where I left it. So st rotational stability is excellent. Classical examples, minus 17, two diopter cylinder, both eyes operated, happy patient. Minus 27, minus 3D, look at the smile on the patient's face. Minus 15, with uh, minus 17, see the patient. This is twin brothers. One brother has got operated, he's happy, and now he's got his younger brother. Again, twins, uh, these are the children of the, the tourism minister of uh, Assam. The daughter and son both got operated on the same day, 12 diopters and 10 diopters each. Now, this is minus 29 diopters with two diopter cylinder, both eyes operated. See the smile. Now, this is an ace, minus 34 with 2.5. Now, can you ever imagine what is the kind of difference we people as doctors are making in their lives? We are changing not their lifestyles, we have changed their lives. This man, this young Sikh gentleman, used to be a very big introvert. He was a good, very good guitar player, but at minus 34, he would just practice at home. After I operated him, his mother says he started going and playing at the concerts. His outlook has changed. He's become so happy and confident. So this is what a simple surgery can make a difference in somebody's life. Eight diopters, eight millimeter optic size, 8.5 millimeter optic size. Now I'll just go very swiftly on the videos. So this is a refractive solution for large pupils where you can't do LASIK. So this is an 8.5 millimeter pupil. I won't repeat. I'll just show you the size of the lens. Look at the size of the lens. And the only one person to give thanks to this is Mr. Sanjay Argal, who is at the back end taking care of everything I want. He manufactures lenses to the thing you want. I was yesterday discussing with him that I had to say no to two patients who had iris cysts, and the lens would not sit. He said, sir, give me the UBM. I will make a lens with one arm shortened so that it can fit in the iris, with, behind the iris cyst and still be stable. So this is the kind of technology which we in India are actually producing. See, this is an 8.5 millimeter optic size. I'll again uh, jump the video. This is a cornea scar with 11 diopters of cylinder. Either this patient would need a cornea change, which Dr. Umang would probably recommend, but this patient was not very keen for a cornea transplant, and we did this surgery. So he's got 6 by 18 vision. I'll just jump the video. Look at the corneal scar. 11 diopters of lens inserted in the eye. Patient unaided 6 by 18. So cornea scar. Now let's see something else. Another central corneal scar, 5 diopters. Patient is 6 by 9 post-op. Pure cylinder of 5 diopters. Again, similar situation. You can see a central corneal scar there. Lens in. All you need to do is align the 0, 0,180. The astigmatic has to be as regular as possible. That goes without saying. Now piggyback on a patient who got operated in Chandigarh with a symphony, and she had a plus 4.5 diopters approximate residual power. So she came to me. Somebody told her, explant the lens, explant the lens. So in Chandigarh, probably had operated a few patients. They said, go to Dr. Kapoor. He will not explant your lens. 
So I did not explant a lens. We just got another lens manufactured for her shape and size. We put another lens on top of the symphony, and the patient is 6'6 six, six, and 6. We could have needed, we would have needed to explant the lens, large incision, or cut it, cause trauma, maybe capsular bag issues, hemorrhage, iris trauma, nothing. Again, this is a patient operated by me 17 years ago. This was a little boy who got hit with a beer bottle. His father was alcoholic, he broke the bottle on the table, the beer bottle cut his cornea. So I operated him 17 years ago. He came to me with, as a little child I operated him, he came to me with minus 17 diopters of myopia. Now what could I do in such a case? The fibrose capsule, so I have to sacrifice the whole bag. Complete posterior sinecure, no place for an add-on or a sulcoflex lens. Who comes to the rescue? Mr. Sanjay Argal. So I just go in, cut the iris, create a place, minus 17 lens, put it, patient 612 unable from minus 70. Since it's an 80 micron lens, which will fit beautifully even in a small space, we do that and the patient is doing great. Again, a keratoconus, post-keratoconus, post-cross-linking, uh, post-intact, these patients do exceptionally well. Once you've got a really uh, regularized astigmatism in control and if everything is stabilized, not a very high astigmatism, these patients, oh, this video is not playing. One thing to be careful in keratoconus patient is you will get a false ACD. A lot of times in a very high keratoconus, you will get a wrong ACD and you will end up going in for a higher vault. This is what can happen. So I've learned from my mistakes. This is what happens. I planned the wrong ACD. You can see there's a ACD is apparently high, but the angle is crowded. So I put the lens in. The patient on the second day started showing increase in trocular pressure. So we had to reprogram the whole vault of the lens. And this is where we learned that in two patients of keratoconus, things start. Now this is again and a very amazing thing which is happening. A press biopic IPCL is a boon for your patients whom you've operated earlier. You've operated them. You've done simple monofocal lens for them. And now they come back to you. They say, okay, I want a multifocal. So what do you do? Either you go in for a lens explantation, which cannot be possible in all the times. You can simply go and push in an 80, 85 microns of a press biopic IPCL. This is a primary uh, surgery with primary a patient with, this is a 55 year old uh, patient. Again, I'll, I'm jumping the videos. You put in the lens and this is how the lens looks like. You have a near add of 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3. You, for a beginner, it's a good idea to start plan with the, the uh, less dominant eye first. Then you can actually, uh, this is my OT technician. My OT technician, I operated 14 years ago. So each time when he would come and assist me, he had trouble, his glasses would keep falling over his mask. So one day he said, sir, aap sabka karte ho, mera surgery mein ek unit dalte. So I requested the company, they gave me two lenses free. I put it in my OT technician and I'm proud to say he can bend the cystic tome better than me without microscope. I am in a press by a big age. I, I need the microscope to bend the 26 gauge needle. He bends the needle. This is one of his eyes. So you can see I had put Acrios AO in him 14, 12, 14 years ago. And this is another press biopic lens on top of the Acrios AO. He had a little amount of astigmatism and a little bit of hyperopia, which was canceling each other. This is a post-traumatic case. Why, why I want to show this is, this is, the lens is so soft and gentle on the tissue. This is a patient in Australia. He's a tennis player. He got hit with the eye. Actually see, the lens has actually moved onto the iris. And this lens was like this for 22 days till he got time to come from Australia. There was no cataract. So all I needed to do was just push in the lens back again and the patient was ready to go. So the lens is a very soft material. It's very gentle on the eye. So only issues, uh, these are the issues. Explantation for cataract six. One was post-trauma. The patient got boxed in the eye in a fight. Four other explants due to bad sizing. I will never say a product is bad. Our measurements were wrong. Our measurements were higher or lower. And uh, this is a 297 volt. This is 18 month old patient. No cataract, crystal clear anterior capsule. This is 864, 1008. So it's very tolerant to high vault. This is again a one step solution in my opinion. I use a lot of trifocal as a clear lens extraction for my patients, high myopes, hypermetropes with cylinders. So this is, I operated this case day before yesterday. Two diopters, with, he was a hyperope, 54 year old hyperope. This is how the lens would look. 
All you need to do, again, this lens is a smart lens. You need to just put it at 0, 180. No need to dial it. Post femto cases, moderate amount of astigmatism. We are doing a lot of uh, 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 relaxing incisions and putting these lenses. This is, I'll just show you a video. This is a patient, high myop, 53 years of age, and the power is, just see the power. This is, of course, you can look at the fundus glow and say it's a myopic patient. I would just want to see this. Look at this. The IOL is minus three with minus four cylinder. Clear lens extraction, minus three diopters with minus four cylinder. Patient doing exceptionally well. These are post-op patients, so even if there's a fibrosis, there are no decentrations. This is again a one-step solution, piggyback, add-on lens, I'll just skip this, and thank you. I think this is the most frequently asked question to me. I do not rely on one particular system. I use my Cirrus on an edit mode, which means I do not take what the machine tells me. We switch off the lights because on a black and white mode, it, if it's a very brightly lit room, it's difficult at times to catch the, the black and white photograph. We switch off the lights and we see the edge, number one. Number two, if you want me to say caliper, no. Caliper is my only confirmatory tool. Because I have realized I did a double blind study with my optometrist and myself. If nobody tells me the reading and I take a reading from caliper, it can be different by 0.2 to 0.4 mm each time. The same person. And once you hand the same caliper to another person, it can be different. So we use the caliper only if there is a lot of discrepancy in the digital methods. And another thing which I use is I use uh, auto refractor keratometers, which have people, people measuring systems in it. So we take three consecutive readings of that, edit mode of Cirrus, and if required, then a caliper. The it works 100% of yeah, the time. The second question is, of a more than 40 years older patient with clear lens, how you select uh, between IPCL and trifocal lens? Okay, the trifocal lenses, actually once you're taking out the lens, if there's no lenticular change, I would probably, and there's a high amount of myopia, I would not want to subject the eye to a surgery of removal of the lens because of course of the issues uh, associated with the retina. But in case it's not a very high myopia, it's a borderline myopia, I wouldn't want to, uh, I would just go single step and go in for a trifocal. But in case of a high myopia, until at least there's no other option, but if suppose the patient is 54, 55, like that patient, it's no use putting in a uh, IPCL because after a few years you'll be doing a cataract anyway. There in those situations, I'll go in for a trifocal. Any question from audience? comes to around 30 and you want to put IPCL and you know that uh, he's a being a high myop he can develop cataract also later on so no, all of us will develop cataract yes so no I mean myops have a higher tendency definitely so would you uh, would you counsel the patient that yes of I, course I, yes okay now let me tell you uh, we tell all our patients that we are putting this lens and whenever you get a cataract this lens comes out and a new lens goes in this is a standard counseling advice given to them now, in case you are trying to say that I am trying to give a hidden agenda that my lens might cause, might cause a cataract and I might want to explain it, we just mention in the consent form that it is reported rarely this lens may induce cataract. In that situation, it is to be taken out. But otherwise, there's no reason to scare the patient unnecessarily. Yes, all patients of high myope are warned that whether you get the surgery done or not, you may have a retina detachment. So once we correct your vision, it doesn't mean your eye has become like me or somebody else normal. You still need to be on follow-up for the rest of your life. Two of the patients had retina detachments after two to two and a half years of surgery. It would have happened anyways. Uh, Absolutely. Otherwise. Thank you. I think uh, two extra advice. Most of people are doing, but I'm just suggesting that mark the patient 0180 before the block. And whether it is non-toric or toric, mark all cases to give a most appropriate wall, and even the non-toric cases to try to place in 0 to 180. Because the lens is designed in a such a way, it will give most appropriate Maximum wall. horizontal uh, distance. Yeah. One more tip is, I'll just add to that, in case you have an astigmatism, more than two diopters, 
take the vertical caliper also. It will help. It will help to have the size of the plates, the plate size also. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. Thank now you. I invite Dr. Umar Mato to speak on my four years experience with IPC. Thank you. Dr. Kapoor has actually uh, helped me by doing most of my talk. So, uh, so IPSEL I've been doing exclusively as uh, for the last four years, and generally very happy with the results. Uh, as Dr. Kapoor mentioned, it has a wide range. Uh, unlike the other companies, which are generally up to about 18 diopters, this can be customized to a very uh, long range of uh, refractive errors that can be co uh, corrected. And it's a customized lens. So whatever is required, that can be created uh, for you. And uh, not only for my myopia, it corrects the astigmatism. Uh, I haven't done too much of it, but presbyopic, uh, as we just heard, is another possibility with uh, this lens. Uh, what do you need uh, before you do the surgery? You need to know the manifest refraction. You need keratometry. You need the anterior chamber depth. And here it's important uh, to know what kind of instrument you're using for your anterior chamber depth. If you're using an ultrasound, you also need the pachymetry, and then you subtract that. Uh, or you need to give it to the company, they'll do it for you, but you do need to mention how you've uh, taken the anterior chamber depth because you want it from the back of the cornea uh, and not include the corneal thickness. Uh, you need the white to white, and yes, there are lots of papers. Unfortunately, there's not a single device which you can say is the gold standard. Uh, over a period of time, I think all of us devise what works well for us. It's good to take uh, two different instruments if possible. Uh, even a Pentacam works. Uh, you could use an anterior segment OCT and the digital calipers. So uh, even the I newer IUL masters give that. So try to do it uh, with at least two methods and have a good correlation between them. It's optional to do the endothelial cell count, but if you want to follow up your patients, it's uh, good to have it in in your records, but you don't need it for the measurements uh, if you're doing this procedure. As Dr. Kamal Kapoor mentioned, uh, this is how the lens looks like. So the most important thing that you need to know is the vault. So the convexity should face up. And the other way of confirming that is look at these notches. So on the leading side, it should be on the left. And on the trailing side, it should be on the right. So this is important to know. So the most important thing is that you don't want it to upside down. It needs the convexity should be up. Uh, the other thing that this lens has is that there are two other holes uh, on, the op on the optics. Preferably, they are better placed on the superior side under the lids. So if you're doing the right eye, when you're loading it, you must ensure that uh, when you're loading it, it should be on your left. And if you're on the left eye, when you load it, you need the holes accordingly. So these should be placed under the lids. More than anything, if it comes down, doesn't matter. It's the vault that is more important. But when you're, the lens is opening in the eye, I sometimes look at this because this sometimes is not that visible. Uh, especially if you have an air bubble by mistake in the anterior chamber while the lens is going in. But this gives you an idea, okay, you're opening correctly. So be conscious of how you're loading the lens. Of course, this newer edition has made a lot of difference to me. Uh, and I'll talk about it. This hole in the middle, uh, surprisingly, as a lot of studies have shown, doesn't cause a difference to the vision, but I think it makes the anterior lens capsule clearer and the aqueous circulation is so much better with this hole. And it's designed in a way that it doesn't cause diffraction of light. So a few tips again on this. I think this is the most critical step. So in fact, I load the lens even before I make the incision. And 
So you look at the vault, place it with the vault on the right side, and then you position the holes. So this is the holes now coming on this side, these two holes. And you have this notch here. Now it's a very thin lens. So before you close, it's like your regular butterfly cartridge. And before that, don't put too much visco inside. Uh, in fact, uh, what I do is that uh, I would actually put fluid first in the cartridge. So you want to remove all the air bubble. So you put some uh, BSS in the cartridge and maybe a little bit of visco over that. You don't want air bubbles. Uh, not that it matters to the movement of the lens. Uh, you don't want air bubbles to impair your visibility when it's opening in the eye. Okay. One second. So before you close it, this is uh, one, one minute, sorry. So before you lock the cartridge, this is an additional precaution that you take your McPherson and move the lens and ensure that it's freely moving. Because it's so thin that if it's caught in the lips, it can tear. So ensure under the microscope that it is moving freely and only then lock it. Uh, we put basically very little visco in the beginning, just a few ribbons of viscoelastic. You don't want visco to get trapped under the lens. So don't overfill the eye like a like you do for a rexus and a good clear corneal temporal incision and i agree that it's good to mark the uh, eye for all cases not just for the toric lenses uh, that's a very good tip be careful when you're introducing your uh, blades because you have a clear lens inside which you shouldn't be touching so uh, now when the lens is halfway in, stop. Ensure which side it's opening. And you may need to pronate or supinate your hand accordingly so that the vault is opening correctly. And that you ensure either by looking at this notch here or the holes when you have. Uh, Now, studies in India have shown that this gives very good results. And uh, this is a study from Dr. Ramamurthy's group that uh, there were no significant complications intraoperative. Uh, only three eyes had some cataract, of which there were only one that was significant. Uh, IOP rise is actually not very common probably due to steroid use, and you don't need too much of topical steroids. I give just four to one uh, for three weeks. It, it doesn't require as much of steroids as you need for uh, cataract. Uh, and the endothelial cell count is uh, only about 2%. So the, in their study, they did not find any vision-threatening complication. Our own first 100 cases, we were, if we removed some of the amblyopic, but the others, the UCVA was almost 90% 6.9 or better. And the residual refractive error of less than one diopter was in 82%. So the calculations that we give, uh, what comes out, the, the lens is very predictable, both the cylinder and the sphere. We did have some cataract in the initial group. Ever since I've been started using the newer lens with the hole, uh, I've not had a single case with uh, any lenticular change. Uh, I think it's the aqueous movement uh, which is very important. And when, uh, so with the hole, 
uh, now there's no opacification. And most of these cataracts were in the visual axis, so it's not because of manipulation during surgery. It probably was a little infarction of the anterior capsule. Uh, we had a few cases with IOP rise uh, in the initial two to three weeks, which settles with a single uh, anti-glaucoma medication, and they are all off medication. Uh, I wouldn't say retinal detachment is not a problem. Uh, these are all high myopic patients. They are prone to detachments. Uh, when there is fluctuation in the anterior chamber, I think you can always uh, have that induced. So. I make it a point one within three to four weeks of surgery, of course, before any ICL, I get the retina screen, not just by myself, I get my retina colleague to have a look. And at three to four weeks, I get it done again. And then, of course, subsequently, they need yearly follow-ups like any myos would. But I have this extra step of getting screening done between three to four weeks in case there's any traction that has got produced. So you... Some of the cataracts, like what I mentioned, were insignificant. The patients were not complaining, but they were this anterior lens kind of haze in some cases. This is in the early post-op period. You may have some visco collected, which clears. So don't panic when you see some of these opacities in the early uh, post-op period. So thank you so much. Thank you. So I want to add one thing. When the care group has changed from V1 to V2, Definitely, there's a more advanced design, but the change of material also for the same size, it will give a better vaulting. Yeah. So measurement is should be very accurate. See, when it is more or less 0.1 mm, there should be not much difference, but it should not be cross the 0.1. If it is become 0.2, if uh, error is 0.2, then we'll have a lot of problem, either increase in size or much decrease in size. So w at least two separate methods of measurement in which one cali one should be the caliper measurement and at least by the two assistants. So you just take the result and if you feel there's a difference, you measure it of your own. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Any, oh, sorry, any from the audience, anyone also ask? Because you guys are running short of time, so business path, yeah. So I think Dr. Sonu Goel is here or not? Huh? No, no. So I invite Dr. Saurabh Patwardhan for advanced monofocal all about vision. Not audible. Hello, yes. So good afternoon everyone, I am Dr. Saurabh Patwadhan and I will be speaking about this uh, new innovative IOL which Care Group has produced. I remember talking with uh, uh, Mr. Sanjay around two years back and I had this idea in mind and uh, he took it upon and uh, then he developed this particular IOL and I think it is going to change uh, the practice of cataract surgery significantly in you know next uh, few years to come. So. There is always a search for the ideal IOL, which is always on. And uh, many uh, surgeons are of the belief that uh, monofocal is a no headache IOL. You know, the patient doesn't have to adjust, no neuroadaptation like in multifocal. So it's just like you put it and you forget it, patients are quite happy. But is it really so? Uh, if you look at even with the latest uh, refractive formulas that we have at present, uh, if you see, uh, is this a video which you have started? I want the presentation. Is the presentation? It's, it's running on the auto mode. Okay, so if you look at even with the latest uh, IL formulas that we have now, uh, we are quite happy with these formulas, right? But if you look at the real you know, statistics, 80% of our patients have 
yes, within plus minus 0.5 diopter refractive error, residual refractive error after the uh, putting the monofocal IOLs. But what about the rest 20%? They have more than 0.5 diopter refractive error in the post-operative period, and which you might say that it's uh, you know insignificant. Patient can accept that. Yes, patient do accept that. But I was recently uh, going through one of the testimonials of a ophthalmologist himself who underwent femtolasic procedure. And in one eye, he had uh, plano, and in other eye, uh, he had just uh, point seven five point uh, I think five diopter myopia left, and uh, he realized that what is the kind of difference that you know this small refractive error makes in the quality of vision that patient has, and then he said that uh, after you know experiencing this, for all his LASIK patient that he operates now onwards, he will you know give option of correcting even you know point five or point seven five diopter refractive residual error after LASIK. So. I think we are only looking at the numbers like six by nine. It, can you just stop it? Excuse me. Just slideshow is not turning well. Okay, so just wanted to show you this left eye picture is a simulated vision of a six by six when patient has you know zero refractive error. But if you induce just 0.75 diopter of refractive error, you know just look at the picture how it is. You know you are happy because patient is reading six by nine in your uh, in your clinic. But what in real world, the, what patient sees is not absolutely not equivalent to what patient sees when he is six by six unaided. It's not just the you know quantity of vision, but the quality of vision goes down significantly. Is it okay now? No, no, no. This is the slides now. Okay. So let's see. So uh, what my expectation from monofocal was that it should give at least unaided 20 by 20 visual acuity in all, all my patients. That at least I should assure, you know, even if I'm not assuring him really great near vision, but that should be my assurance to my patients, which are, you know, almost 80 to 90% of my cataract volume. So thanks to uh, care group, now they have got this uh, IOL, which is uh, named as magnificent, and it is, uh, it, has a, it is a monofocal IOL with some depth of focus in it. So this is the optical profile of this IOL. And as you can see here, the range of uh, the power decreases from the center to periphery. And the range is around 2 to 2.25 diopters. But if you see the central 3 millimeter zone, which is actually used, it is around 1.2 millimeter to 1.2 to 1.3 diopteric power, which translates to somewhere around 0.9 to 1 diopter. Okay, so. I started using this IL and I decided to compare with uh, the basic lens of care group, which is Acrial EC, which was our standard lens for our patients. So uh, in 30 eyes, I implanted this magnificent IL, which is now named. And uh, in 30 eyes, I implanted Acrial EC, which was my standard monofocal IOL. And I excluded, of course, those patients who had less vision or high astigmatism and where the vision, the potential vision was less than six by six. And I uh, tested all these patients after one month to uh, take care of the pseudo accommodation in the early uh, post-operative period. And then we uh, did detailed evaluation of uncorrected and best corrected visual acuities for distance intermediate and the near. And then I calculated depth of focus curve for each island. This is the average depth of focus curve which I got after the study. So I think all of you are aware of the depth of focus curve where we start uh, after doing the proper distance refraction, we start adding plus 0.5 to 3 and minus 0.5 to minus 3 and check the distance visual acuity. And we check how the vision is you know, changing with these additions and uh, uh, additions of minus and plus lenses. So what you see here is that the depth of focus curve, this blue indicates the advanced monofocal which I have used in this study, which indicates that it has a broader depth of focus. You can see from zero to almost minus one diopter, it is maintaining vision which was better than six by nine. As compared to the Acreol EC, which is a standard monofocal IL, you can see it just maintains the vision from zero to minus 0.5. So it gives me added advantage of this additional uh, extended depth of focus. So how did it translate to my clinical? Uh, now just to compare, if you see the depth of focus, what it was allowing me was the patient was able to see the distance object very clearly. And apart from that, the patient had around 100 to 90 centimeters of range of vision. So clinically what I found that all these patients, all 30 eyes, 
had 100, all 100% hundred eyes had uncorrected vision of 6 by 9 or better, which was just 80% as expected in the conventional monofocal eye well, which is tremendous improvement, I feel. For intermediate vision, the I took only N10 because this IL was not providing N6 in all patients, but even N10 is a practically good intermediate vision and which was present in almost 100% in advanced uh, IOL, while it was present only in 18% of the conventional IOL. And near vision, again, with uh, advanced monofocal, it was present in 50%, and 10 or better, while it was just 9% in the conventional monofocal IOL. So I thought that we can use it further in different ways. What I used was the standard A constant, which is used for the base lens of Acriol EC. So here I was targeting uh, emetropy on all my patients. But we can use it differently. For example, if I target, suppose, around 0.3 diopters or 0.5 diopters hypermetropia, what it will give, it will give me a range of vision. But because as you know, that even with the standard refractive formulas or the best refractive formulas, you have residual refractor error of almost in 95% case, uh, almost in 20% cases, which is above 0.5. So if we can have this range of you know, focus in your IOLs, then it can give in almost in 100% cases, six by six uncorrected vision, irrespective of the residual refractive error predicted by the refractive formula. So that is one way to use it, that you want patients to have the best distance vision uncorrected. Second way to use it is for the blended monovision. As you know now, the press by epic, LASIK, and uh, press bound is very common, and where they try to use this blended monovision. So instead of having one IOL without any depth of focus with, uh, you know, with uh, emetropia and another with minus 1.5, you don't have really good stereopsis for the intermediate vision. But if you target emetropia in the distant dominant eye and minus one or minus 1.25 in the near uh, dominant eye, what you can really get is right from infinity to the near point of around 50 centimeters, that kind of range of vision you can get with good amount of stereopsis, particularly for intermediate vision, which is which we commonly use in our daily uh, usage. So that's the range of vision we can develop with using of the standard, I would say modified monofocal IOL. So uh, my experience with this uh, new monofocal design is uh, excellent so far and we'd like to also continue this study further. So I think this is a monofocal IL which a lot of versatility. You, you can use it to improve the intermediate vision of the patient. You can use it to you know, assure the patient 20 by 20 for distance in all cases. You can use this for blended monovision as I was mentioning. So I think this is going to change at least my practice and I'm sure it is going to change uh, practice of a lot of cataract surgeons when they utilize this particular IL in their practice. So thank you so much for this, uh, inviting me for this talk. Any uh, questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Talk? Padvadan, for a wonderful talk. I think uh, uh, this lens has been added very decently. Yes. So I've not done any surgery on this lens, but what I felt from the, your talk, that is, I think this lens is designed in such a way to reduce the spherical aberration and to give a better point spread function and the depth of focus is increased. Yes, so uh, actually when we had a talk maybe a couple of years back with Sanjay, what I told him that uh, we don't want, uh, we most of our patients need good distance visual acuity, but in my case, I cannot assure it in eight, uh, almost 20% patients. So can we develop something? So we are re really not looking at, you know, plus three diopter of uh, near addition in these patients, but a, uh, you know, safety margin where even if the patient has say residual error of plus 0.5 as per the refractive formula, still patient will be six by six. Because you know, say the same power, having the same power, if you increase the contrast sensitivity, it will in increase the depth of focus. That is the way and advantage of lens I will do, then I will be able to tell more. And anyone want to ask any question from them? Yeah, it's a basic principle is refractive edo. That means there are no steps. It is a continuous curvature there from. Curvature there is a curvature change. So from the center to the periphery, there will be a curvature change. And uh, what we are targeting is not plus 1.5 or plus 2 uh, near addition, but just around plus 1 to 1.1. 1 .1 That's addition. why the because of the curvature change, they are nullifying the spherical aberration. 
what happens so when you increase this curvature change in the center is that the mtf value you know go, decreases so it reduces the quality of vision but here the quality of vision will be maintained because we are not attempting to you know give very high additions what is the mtf value of this lens it's 0.43 which is uh, as good as any monofocal yeah. which is there thank you thank you so much you finished that uh, session in on time so